Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, I, I know some of you. I, I've seen names that uh, don't ring a bell for a new PhD student, new postdocs. Welcome. I'm, I'm Martin. I'm a TCS doing research in software engineering. Uh, so I typically publish in the IEEE uh, transactions on software engineering, for instance. Uh, so it all is about software and execution. Uh, so here in the room, yes. Could you switch on your video? That would be great. Oh, I can. Is it here? No, because it's uh, so the video is here. Oh. Okay, but that video is off because we don't see you there. But, but, no, no, they can see me, so you can see me. No, on the in Zoom we don't see you. Okay. Yes. It's, yes, it's, yes, it's, it's a separate camera. Right? Okay, so it's, okay. Yeah, that's okay. good. Very good. Thank you, Dedek, for okay for okay. doing the the check the other oh, yeah. check. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, guys. No worries, so it's hybrid, so hybrid is a little bit more friction than uh, pure in-person. Um, so here in the room, we have, a, we have a PhD student, a research engineer. So Arvin mentioned that I volunteered to give a talk. Uh, but you know, it's in, in academia, so in academia, you always volunteer. Uh, but actually, the real story is that Arvin came to me and asked me whether I would be happy to give a talk. And of course, I'm very happy to give a talk today <laughs> to you in person, to you here. It's always great to have talks, to have scientific talks between us. We, we tend, in the same institution, we tend to uh, over-communicate over administration and, and non-important stuff <laughs> and, uh, and under-communicate in terms of scientific output and scientific research. So I'm, I'm, I love to, to see my colleagues talking about their science and, and research. So yeah, I volunteered. No, I was asked and I was happy to, to give a talk today. Uh, when Arvind uh, asked me, I also discovered this concept of curtain talk. And then I matched, okay, yeah, remember I saw those curtains at Digital Futures. Uh, they, were, they, they are fancy. Uh, and so when I, when I realized this, uh, the first thing I did was to go on Amazon and to see whether we can buy curtains with code. Uh, and indeed, you can have a shower curtain with code, with JavaScript code, with the C code, if you want to read code when you, when you, are in the, when you take a shower. So that's also very good. Uh, so Kalle, or if somebody in the top management of Digital Futures, you want to maybe have one curtain with code, that's also an option. We can have one in, at Digital Futures. Um, and then, so talking about equations, uh, indeed, so I'm, I'm a software person, um, and so I execute things. That's my daily job, that's our daily job with my students. Uh, we execute a lot. And... Um, and this is the whole story of today is uh, equations on the one side and execution on the other side, uh, which is which can be seen this way or not. Uh, yes, very good. So on the my right hand side, it's motionless math. You know something very static written on paper, very uh, equations. And on the other side, blistering computation. So something that executes on a processor today, and we are not anymore in, in the 50s, uh, when we mean execution, we mean billions of instructions per second. Something that our, our, our sense of time cannot even capture. Uh, we, it goes extremely fast by, by, uh, by orders of magnitudes of what we can even uh, imagine in terms of speed. So we have this kind of proposition, and. Um, and here is a nice illustration. So that's uh, very static. It's a, a piece of artwork. But actually, uh, you can start thinking of, OK, let's move it a little bit. Uh, so this artwork is rendered in the browser. Uh, yeah, it's, you can see it moving slowly. And so here, my talk is really about going from something purely static to something moving, and potentially something moving very fast at the end, as fast as a, a, a computer is today. That's where. We want to go. Um, yeah, one day we will die. So this is a this is a piece of uh, of uh, crypto art by a digital artist. And it's also the number is very interesting. Yeah, Forty-two. Yeah, so, so. Yes. So. Uh, so that's uh, that's really so motionless motionless math uh, versus uh, versus computation. How to to reconcile? them, what it means. And so here we go over a few examples of math and computation together. And again, there is no opposition. It's actually the opposite. You'll see my, 
last slide, I, I really see and, and, I, and I foresee a convergence of both uh, to a very large extent. Um, and so this is what we what we'll be talking about. So let's start with, with an example, uh, for instance. So this is uh, the gross Pitaevsky equation. Uh, it's in the field of uh, physics. Yes? This black box, is it intentional or...? It's an artifact of uh, the students. Oh, this is the zoom. Oh. It's an installation. Is that better now, Harry? Excellent. Uh, so the gross Pitaevsky equation, uh, here I'm calling Wikipedia, it describes the ground state of a quantum system of identical bosons using the r 3 fock approximation and the pseudo-potential interaction model. Uh, so it has the beauty of an equation uh, with the equal sign, uh, a few uh, Greek symbols, and it's done by very uh, brilliant minds. Uh, so here, you know, you, may, you might not know Pitaevsky, uh, but Pitaevsky is really brilliant. He's even, so he's himself the academic son of Lando. Lando is a Russian physician from, from, from USSR. Yes. And Lando is a kind of guy who know he had a lecture with uh, Einstein. And he's known for at some point in a lecture say, um, Albert, sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> and then demonstrating that there was one point which was uh, incorrect in Albert's demonstration on, on the board. So this kind of, you know, Russian uh, scientist, uh, very, very brilliant, simply. And so here we are in the field of uh, theoretical physics, uh, uh, and so bosons or something. We are really in the field of theoretical physics, not, not in experimental physics. And so we have an equation. Um, this equation, so it's math, we can study it, you can, we can read papers on the math level, but at some point we want to find, to find solutions to this, to this equation. So typically, in, for which input this equation is equal to zero. So that's the, 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 the core thing we, we learn at high school. Uh, so we want to find solutions. And for very complex solutions, we need a computer for doing that. Finding solutions cannot be done uh, in an analytical manner. We need a computer to find the solutions, and those solutions are what matters. So they matter as much as adding the equation. So the equation is the infrastructure, and the solution is at the actionable part of the equation. So that's extremely important. So we need computers for this. And here, let's go uh, to uh, one implementation. So the paper is published in Computer Physics Communication, 2009. The implementation, uh, open science implementation, we are in Fortran. Um, so Fortran is a language uh, invented in 1954, a long time ago. And indeed, the, the roots of the language is bridging math and computation together. Fortran stands for formula translation. Um, so formula equation, we can, uh, we can equate that for today. And, uh, and so that's a Fortran program. Uh, it feels like a Fortran program. Everything is uppercase because back in the days there was no uppercase, lowercase. Everything is very uh, low level. Uh, and so here we, we really see and we feel that the difference between the, the typeset equation, the previous slide, and this program, there is a huge gap. They are connected because, again, this program implements, to some extent, implements the equation to find solutions. Yet there is a huge gap, a mental gap, an implementation gap between both. Uh, side note about Fortran. So Fortran is major for, for computer science, for computational science. Uh, there are ex lots of key scientific discoveries made thanks to Fortran programs, uh, including key routines uh, for inverting matrices, uh, com computable kind of stuff. That's done in Fortran. We still use uh, today lots of Fortran code in, com in computational science. And for a story, I, 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 I've been told that um, in Fortran programs like this one, there are very low level optimizations, which were done either for the hardware of the 60s or for the compilers of the 60s. And so basically, the those optimizations, they are implicitly for those uh, cases, which are completely irrelevant today. So in, in, in the core Fortran programs, in the essential Fortran programs we have today for science, some of them might be completely underperforming because they were optimized 40 years ago. Uh, and we would, we would have today to recruit a new Fortran engineer 
to optimize those Fortran programs per the current Fortran compilers. Uh, I would say to the, today it would be uh, GCC front end, were the major one, uh, and uh, and the current architecture, other architecture that we have today, which is completely different from what we had uh, 50 years ago. So that's a, a, a side note on 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 the on the impact of, of computation on on the way we we interpret equations. So that's Fortran, like old father, uh, grandfather of everything. Let's move on to another equation uh, and, and another implementation, slightly more modern. So here, uh, this is a wave equation. So a wave equation, uh, it's also very well known. It's a second order linear partial differential equation arising in the fields of acoustics, electromagnetics, and fluid dynamics. Everything, everywhere we, we have waves. And, uh, and this is extremely important. Uh, so right now, this computer is uh, over Wi-Fi, uh, wi so lots of waves happening, lots of interferences. Um, and um, here another illustration of a real problem. Uh, so that's what happens in the sea. Uh, when 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 you when you send uh, acoustic waves in the sea, um, that's a topic we have been looking at recently. A GPS uh, cannot go underwater because it's uh, it's uh, electro uh, uh, waves, uh, which means that uh, under under underwater you need some other kinds of positioning system and communication system. Uh, so it's a completely different world. It's still hers, you know, but as soon as you are underwater, like for submarines and so on, it's a completely different world. And in that world, the major problem is that waves, uh, so you, of course you can send some acoustic waves, but they rebound on both the surface and the floor of the ocean. And over time, you know, with all the rebounds, the signal is completely lost, and it's just terrible. Um, as soon as you have more physical waves, so like sea waves on the top, it's even worse because the refraction goes in all possible directions. And here, um, I was discussing with a colleague of us at the Department of, um, of Robotics over there. You can fine tune a communication algorithm and equation, which would in theory work perfectly for uh, in, in the ocean over a very long distance. But as soon as you have a single drop of water coming on top of the ocean, as soon as you have a, si a, a single perturbation, everything is broken and your optimization is basically useless. So the optimization on paper is perfect, but in practice, there is nothing to be done. So it's really uh, underwater waves is a, a real problem. And, uh, and again, so here comes a lot of, of uh, computation to overcome this. So let's go to uh, simulation of wave. So we use simulation for this. So it's not finding uh, finding uh, solutions as the previous example. Here we use simulation. So we, we compute basically the the field of the uh, of the wave over all possible points in the in the space under study. And here we go to another scientific programming language, MATLAB, uh, invented in the beginning of the eighties. This is real code, as the previous piece of code. It's real code uh, from uh, from a scientist from Saint Petersburg, and a paper, uh, a MATLAB-based two-dimensional parabolic equation, water wave propagation package, published in IEEE Antennas and Propagation, May 2005. So this is MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is more modern than Fortran. What we see is that the, the, the syntax is closer to the equation we had at the, in, the, in the first place. Uh, so of course we can have lowercase, uh, um, uppercase, um, but here in MATLAB, which we can already have, and which we probably have here, so we have support for vectors directly, so we can specify vectors, we can multiply, uh, multiply matrices in MATLAB directly with the, as we would write it uh, 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 on paper, so it's going, it's going much, much closer to, to the equation. Uh, and indeed, it's uh, N plus in MATLAB as opposed to Fortran, there is a very strong standard library with support for all kinds of operations. Of course, uh, uh, some, uh, some, some trigonometric operations, but also some other more advanced things. So we have both a better language and a strong uh, library, standard library, for expressing what we want to express. 
So that's MATLAB. MATLAB is massive today. It's, it's still massively used. Here, I, 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 my understanding is that uh, maybe Arvin, in your department at engineering science, uh, there is a lot of MATLAB code which is being written uh, at KTH in universities in general. Myself, I, I wrote quite a bit of MATLAB when I was a student. Uh, when I did my, my master's thesis with Benjo, I, I, it was partly in MATLAB too. Uh, so myself, I, had, I, I have some MATLAB background. Um, I don't write MATLAB anymore, and I don't advocate for MATLAB anymore because I became an open source person, yes. and depending on the proprietary engine, I, it scratches a little bit. Uh, uh, but so there are some open source uh, reinvention of MATLAB, uh, Octave, Scilab, uh, which are not necessarily fast, which are not necessarily backward compatible, fully backward compatible with, uh, with MATLAB. So we enter into all po possible caveats of, uh, of porting things, and depending on specific uh, uh, runtime. Um, so, but so MATLAB is also a major player in uh, code and equations, and it's still a major player, and I think they will remain for a number of decades uh, today, for sure. Um, so, uh, thanks to Simulink, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks to big business, yeah, yeah and then Simulink, yeah. So Actually, thanks to Octave, right? That's from where they hacked it. Sir? Octave was the original one, and that's what the MATLAB then hacked. I it went in this direction? Yeah. I didn't know that, okay. Yeah, so, so MatWorks is a company, it's big business, very, very expensive license. I would love to know what, uh, what money we give to MatWorks at KDH, uh, but I think it's significant. Uh, and Simulink is a part of uh, MATLAB with the controllers and so on. It's also very important. Um, so that's MATLAB. And again, here we, so the whole story of my talk is that we go ever, ever closer. So we, we close the gap between code and equation, code and equation, code and equation. Um, let's move on to another equation and another implementation. Uh, so we talk now about optimization. So we have uh, we have some kind of function to optimize um, uh, done in different ways. So the classical way is uh, a gradient descent or some kind of gradient descent. And so this is today extremely relevant because this is at, at the heart of. Uh, AI of modern AI, uh, deep neural networks, uh, they are all optimized with a gradient descent and something called back propagation. Uh, and so back propagation consists of calculating the derivative of a loss function that you have with respect to the weight of the network. So here you, you have a partial differential equation with respect to each weight of the network. IJ is a, a specific layer in the neural net and a specific neuron, basically. So it's a partial equation. It fits on one slide, yet for real, think of that we, what we actually uh, compute and what we actually optimize is millions of parameters. Uh, so given, given a loss, given a data set to optimize for, uh, we have millions of such Y parameters. It's basically there are flo floating, uh, floating point numbers. Uh, so we have millions of floating point numbers to optimize uh, against. And this is, a, again, this is the essence of all modern progress on, on, on deep learning. Uh, it's a neural net with millions of parameters. We compute the derivative of the function because of the, the, the neural net eats the function, which can be uh, derived. And we optimize uh, for it. So that's what we do. And of course, we could do it with a Fortran or MATLAB. Uh, yet, uh, we, computer scientists, have invented even better ways closer to the domain that we want to have to, to do that. Um, so that's uh, here, it's Python code, and we'll come back to this in a, in a minute, because the, the key point here of backpropagation is to compute the derivative. And, and of course, we, we can implement both the initial function, so the neural net and its derivative uh, manually, but it would be so much better to automatically compute the derivative function in order to get the gradient directly in a, in a, in a similar manner. So that's something called automatic differentiation. That's something we start to learn at, uh, at school, at high school. Uh, but we can do way more, including so a neural net. Again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's some linear algebra with lots of, of, of connections between, between weights and layers, uh, but it's still uh, something that can be derived in, a, in a, an analytical manner. <laughs> And this is done in an automated way. So today, all neural nets, the derivative of the neural net to get the gradient is done uh, with automatic differentiation. That's good. 
Um, and substitute done in Python on top of a library which uh, encodes this automatic differentiation. Uh, one such library is PyTorch. Um, TensorFlow is another one, for instance, but it's really the job of PyTorch and the job of uh, TensorFlow to do this automatic differentiation. It's not the job of the neural net engineer, of the AI engineer. It's really the job of the library itself. So the library is responsible for automatic differentiation. How could you, as an engineer, tell the library what to differentiate? This is gone through an API, basically. So you use some special data types in your program uh, responded to, to express your neural net. And you use special methods on those data types here. So for instance, here we transpose k dot transpose one two. Uh, so it's a method of the API, and k is of type maybe matrix. Uh, it's a it's a nuclear matrix probably. Um, and so you use a special uh, API method. And as long as you only use those API methods, the library knows how to differentiate the program. And then you can get you can get the the gradient uh, directly just by writing your equation, almost your neural net, your function in this case, in a special way. This is real code uh, taken from a real library, very high profile library called Hugging Face uh, for neural net. Uh, Python code based on PyTorch, and it implements a very complex architecture called the transformer architecture, where there are multiple layers, multiple kinds of att attentions, and here is only a, a bit of it, because we, we here we have a call to the attention method, which itself encodes uh, uh, some other connections, and the library is good enough to, to derive the function, even if the function is described over several methods, spread over several methods. So that's, uh, that's what PyTorch and TensorFlow and all other modern AI libraries can do. That's remarkable, that's a state of the art, uh, that's, that's really, really well done. Uh, Python, 1991, uh, so more modern than the previous ones, very uh, well adapted to write special APIs, and also very adapted, uh, very uh, appropriate to um, to do some kind of metaprogramming to analyze the code being written in Python, which can be very useful for such kind of automated operations. And Python massively used in AI, massively used in general, massively used in data science, massively used in AI. Extremely impactful. So all the equations related to AI are implemented in Python too, virtually all. Virtually all. That's Python. So now that's where we are today, basically. That's uh, and so here we go. We are even closer to the to the concept of the equation. Yet it's not completely natural, but it's, it's getting very close. And, and compared to the previous part, here we can start to do operations on the program. So the program represents the equation, and we can start to operate on it directly in Python. That's pretty cool. Now we move on to the future. Uh, so some things that are not necessarily in production. Um, so ideally what we want to have is that the program itself is differentiable. The whole program, not only the, the one function which describes the neural net. And this is called something called differentiable programming languages. So here we need new programming languages. We cannot reuse Fortran, we cannot reuse MATLAB, we cannot reuse Python. We, we need something new um, to a large extent. Uh, where, and here the key, the tagline is that we move from the equation is expressed in the program to the program is the equation itself. So that's really the, the, the next step. Um, and so here are two key references if you want to read uh, one paper on archive by very famous authors, uh, Abadi and Popkin, about a simple differentiable programming language. And something more um, uh, operation, uh, operationalized, uh, published at ICLR, um, a differential reporting for physical simulation. Uh, so it's a paper proposing the whole thing. And, uh, and the code here uh, is taken from the replication package of this ICLR page, uh, paper. Yes? In what sense is a program an equation? Can you give some simple intuition? Um, in the sense of a function, let's say. 
So if you consider the equation being a function, the program uh, takes inputs, the, the function parameters, and computes something. Well, that's okay, in that sense. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, exactly. So that's in, in that sense. Yes. And you want to reason both uh, uh, concretely and, and, and analytically on top of this, as you do on, an equation, on, on, a, on, a, on a function. On a function, you can compute the actual value, or you can reason about it in different ways. Mm -hmm. The program is, is the function, and you want to both to compute it and also to reason about it. See what I mean? And here, that's a Python code again. But it's slightly different from the PyTorch example, in the sense that uh, here, we have this annotation ti function, so ti is the name of the language, in the sense that the whole body of the function uh, becomes an object for reasoning. It's not only the, the, the object with some specific API methods, in the whole body, including some uh, natural um, operators, like the plus, the times, everything which has been overloaded, here everything is subject to formal reasoning. So that's really the step after the, the API of TensorFlow. It's really, it's really better. Uh, and it's different stable programming language. FYI, so that's something of interest to me because it's slightly hard to explain. But if you can differentiate uh, programs, uh, then finding a better program means uh, computing the gradient of the program and, and, and following the gradient on the program itself. And since all my research is about finding better program, like repairing program, a re a re program repair is about finding a better program than the previous one, my dream and my vision is to do program repair as a uh, gradient descent. And for this, we need a differentiable programming language. Um, it's almost an open call. If you know somebody who would like to do a PhD on this topic, ready to do a PhD, it's kind of disruptive in many ways. Uh, that's, uh, there is something to be done here. So, program repair as gradient descent thanks to different shape of programming languages. I think it, it goes further. It's about uh, reflection at the level of what's inside a function. And there has been uh, some early APIs like JTrack, which is like more than 20 years ago from Compaq, I think, uh, which was discontinued. So, almost all the reflection uh, tools they can tell you what a function is and what variables you have inside, but not about the code. That's where they stop. And then we have a family of very low-level code analysis tools uh, that make it very hard to bridge back to the source. So uh, it's not integrated yet and easy to, to reason about this at the, at the good level. Because uh, you don't want to reason at source code level either. Uh, then you'd have to parse it again, so you want to have a good AST level reasoning, but um, the common APIs don't offer that really, so it's still a scattered effort in, in many different directions. Yeah. So that's a different level of language. No, uh, this kind of research domain, it's invented as much in, in, in companies and in, uh, as in universities. And let's go to the future um, and more cool stuff from today. So. You may have heard about Julia. Julia, it's a programming language which is meant to be as natural as Python and as fast as C, uh, invented at, at MIT. Uh, and in Julia, there is a package called Zigot. And what Zigot does is that it provides source to source, so it relates to what you were saying, automatic differentiation uh, directly in Julia. And here is an example, so that's a rep. Uh, you open Julia using Zigot, very good. You define a function fx equals 5x plus 3. Here we really have the feeling of very close to the math that we used to do. Uh, it's, it's math, and you can do something more complex. And here comes the full beauty. We continue, okay, so please compute f of 10. That's good. And please compute the derivative of f of 10, so f prime of 10 here. And you get the answer. Why? Because uh, by, by importing the Zigot package, uh, it automatically defines the prime operator on functions for free with all the kind of, of metaprogramming you want. Uh, so you don't have any more, any more to do than just writing your function and calling the derivative, period. So here, calling the gradient descent in Julia is a one-liner almost. It's, it's so it differentiates the, the, the... Yes, exactly. F prime is the, 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 the derivative of F here. 
And again, so no syntax, no syntactic knowledge. It's exactly what you want to do. Sorry, but I mean, isn't this what we are also able to do in other programming language like symbolic math, right? So Python Correct. symbolic math and yes. So in symbolic math, you can or you in can, Mathematica, for instance. Yeah, exactly. So yes, correct. Um, that's something I considered when I prepared my talk. Uh, I haven't gone through more like this because, to my knowledge, symbolic math can do concrete computation, but never in an, an optimized manner, in an efficient manner, because they've really focused on the symbolic part of it and not the actual uh, computation part of it. So this is why I excluded them from my presentation, as opposed to Julia and the next slide, which is as much as being symbolic and being very fast, mm. extremely fast. And here, so we get the f and the f prime, the derivative, and of course, that's very nice. We want to be fast, so let's get the binary LLVM code directly out of it, of f prime, and then we have the implementation of the binary code. And so here, it's, it's yeah, so it's even the concrete value of 10 and the direct implementation which has been executed. So we go all the way uh, down from, from the high level math to what's actually implemented when, so when we, when we ask for f prime of 10, what we actually do is to compile the, the result and to execute the result just afterwards. That's super classy. So that's about automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation is cool, um, but we miss some super advanced uh, optimization for linear algebra. So we may want to have both, especially, especially if you are very talented, very rich, and lots of uh, stake. Uh, so if you are a cyborg, you want to do uh, automatic differentiation and accelerated linear algebra to get together at the same time, in the same framework. Uh, so our cyborg friends are at Google, of course, and so they, were, they, 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 are, they wrote and they are maintaining something called JAX, Google JAX. Uh, and so again, so what it does is that automatic differentiation, as we discussed, plus some super advanced accelerated linear algebra, basically what it means is to be able to compute to a GPU and, uh, and to compute very fast, what you wouldn't have in, in some symbolic math uh, software packages, uh, your, your, your math. So here they do this uh, both at the same time, uh, and in a Python-like language, and that's the last, uh, the last uh, snippet for today. So we are in Python, we import JAX, we import what we need, we write a slow version of F. It's slow because if you, if you run it on top of the default Python package, uh, Cyton, it's, it's indeed slow. So slow f is x, y, uh, x, uh, x2 plus x times 2. That's very good. We can compute it on a large matrix. Uh, matrix, that's good. And then what we can do is that we can JIT on the fly. We JIT uh, the function. And, uh, and then it, we can, uh, it becomes fast f. So we have two implementations of the same function uh, in Python. One, one is fast because it's uh, it's uh, accelerated on the GPU, and, he, and after, if you time it with the appropriate Python directives, uh, indeed, uh, it goes much, much faster, and you use the NVIDIA Titan X uh, GPU to, to compute what you want to do with here. So it's a very small snippet. Uh, just imagine that they, at Google, they do it at scale, of course, for all kinds of neural nets and optimization and, 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 and that kind of stuff. So that's, um, that's it. Uh, JAX is open source. Uh, we can do research on top of JAX. It's not much used, uh, but again, it's very, very good, uh, very good stuff. So to conclude, um, I claim and, and I provided uh, evidence that the gap between equations on paper and executable programs is ever decreasing. Uh, we are making always progress to, to close these gaps, such, such, such as at the end. Uh, we can do, we have something which, have, which has the triple characteristics of one, uh, being syntactically close to math, two, being amenable to for, uh, formal reasoning and symbolic reasoning, and three, being extremely fast uh, and to meet the, the constraints that we want to have. So that's a takeaway. Um, as a bonus, uh, so we are working with my PhD student, uh, Ye, on, uh, on we, we do some kind of, 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 so we use this kind of stuff. 
uh, we have a recent paper about uh, neural net back propagation using a program execution. So it's also another way of putting execution and neural nets together. Uh, we, I link the paper here, and it's an open call. We are setting up um, a PhD committee for Yale for the end of this year. If this kind of research and, and reasoning uh, rings a bell, if, if you feel excited about that, uh, I will look for a, a head of a PhD committee. I, I, I'm meeting I'm a committee. So if, if, it, if it rings a bell, just uh, come reach to me after the talk. That, uh, so again, so the gap between equations on paper and executable programs is ever decreasing. It's very good, it's very good news. It's uh, have news for research. Uh, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>